All right, we're in the final stretch of botany and taxonomy for the Master Gardener. This is part five. talked about this a little bit a moment ago. This is gravitropism. It is dictated by various hormones, as I mentioned, too. And this is kind of why, let's look at the lower picture first, why when people ask, can I turn a seat upside down? Yeah, you can, but it's going to figure out which end is up and which end is down very, very quickly. Yes, if you plant them the right way round, it may speed things up by a day or two in like this corn seed, but by and large, once it establishes up and down, it's going to retain that characteristic for maybe the rest of its life. Now, sometimes we'll grow these plants, those upside down tomato tower things that are kind of got popular a few years ago. You know, you're just growing the tomato upside down and it would naturally want to turn itself right back, right back around. So it was kind of a gimmick more than it was anything. But what is happening is the amount of the key uh, hormone is more concentrated at the base of that bent stem or less concentrated at the base of the stem, causing the cells on one side to elongate and on the other side not to elongate as quickly, hence turning the plant to the right orientation. Now why is this important when it comes to cuttings? If you turn cuttings upside down and they've already established which end is up, and you turn them upside down, they know when they're standing on their head. So that can be a problem when you're doing plant propagation from cuttings. By turning the stem the wrong way around, you'll have failure with it. But for seed, it won't be a big problem. Even if you planted a bulb, like a, not that we grow tulips here in Florida, but even if you plant those upside down, they'll right themselves around the next spring. Phototropism, I think we've all seen that in house plants and some other plants maybe around the outdoors where the light is better on one side of the plant versus the other. But auxin, the plant hormone, is responsible for causing the plant to bend toward the light.
I mentioned there were urban factors that influence growth, pruning, staking, spacing, soil compaction, and pollution. Pruning can trigger new growth. That can be good, and it can be bad. Depends on how we do it. Remember, plants have hormones, and they know how to use them. As gardeners, we know how to manipulate, manipulate that. Staking, I mentioned, can weaken trees, because that wiggling makes for stronger plants. Spacing can modify the growth form. Soil co compaction can inhibit plant growth. Pollution, we don't have a lot of that issue, but it can be a problem in other states. Apical dominance. This is something I'm sure every master gardener has manipulated in some way, shape, or form, either knowingly or unknowingly. Let's use our example of patient Lucy's. Uh, impatience. You prefer the scientific genus, I forget. So when your patient impatience got all leggy, what did you do? You pinched them back or cut them back. And in the process, you broke what is called apical dominance. The bud at the top produces a lot of auxin, but once that suppression of the side buds from auxin was diminished, the lateral buds down further on the plant started growing in response to the reduced amount of apical dominance or the reduction of auxin being produced by the apical bud. So we have made plants bushier by doing that. That can be a good thing, right, Master Gardeners? Let's go back. Yeah, okay. So, if I were to have done this, and I've said this many times, as a professional, I would have put in one. And you probably would have looked at me and thought I ripped you off after I charged you a hundred bucks to do it. Or whatever, I would have had a charge for a trip in my time. But why would I have done that? Because I know one would have easily filled that space and still would need pruning in a few years. So what happened here? As the plants grew, we can see at some point about halfway up those naked stems, 
you can see where their first pruning cuts were probably made with the hedge clippers. You can almost see it straight across about halfway up. Put a ruler to the screen if you need to. And at which point we broke apical dominance. So what did we tell the plant to do when we broke apical dominance? Get bushier. So where there once was one stem, now we have three or four all there. And you can see this has been repeated at least three or four more times with probably a hedge clipper. And now we have this, what I heard once said, is this candelabra crust of branches. What a great description. Not mine, but I love it. The point is, we're not really controlling the plant, but it's controlling us. We're constantly out there whacking it back, trying to fit into that space. And we see this a lot around head a foundation or hedge plants around the homes. Most people plant this plant, want to maintain it at about three feet in height. It's planted three feet apart and after about five or ten years they all look pretty hellacious, kind of like these do. I personally would rip them all out and start with something else that'll fit that space a lot better. But people keep on pruning.
Let's talk about what plants sometimes do that we manipulate as human beings. Phytochrome. It's a plant pigment, not with color, but it actually perceives certain wavelengths of light. It is used for the germination process of many seeds. Have you ever wondered why you take a patch of land, you rototill it up, and all of a sudden you get every weed known to mankind growing there? And you wonder, where did all these weave seeds blow in from? probably didn't bro blow in that many weave seeds as you think. They've probably been in the ground for years, maybe centuries for all I know. And until it got enough light, they remained dormant. Once you brought them up to the surface and they got the wavelength of light, it broke a certain dormancy, dormancy in the seed. We'll talk more about that in plant propagation. So a lot of plants need light in order to germinate. Very few want to germinate in the dark. And that's a mechanism for survival when you're buried too deeply. So if you're having issues with growing some of those dust-like seeds like carrots in your vegetable garden and germination has been poor, either you got a bad seed packet or it's old, or maybe you're just planting them too deep. Now you see I have a poinsettia on, in the picture here. Uh, some plants will use it as a timing mechanism. In the case of poinsettias, they only flower when the days are short. So in nature, these will flower usually about uh, right after Christmas time into the new year, after the days have been short for several weeks. Now you're thinking to yourself, but Jim, I see these available at the grocery store and home improvement centers practically the day after Halloween. You're right. How is that possible if the days aren't that short just yet? Well, these will be grown in large greenhouses, and then usually starting about the first week of September, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, employees will pull across the greenhouse um, black shade cloth that won't allow light in, or sometimes this has been mechanized in some greenhouses, and they'll make sure that no light will come in to the crop uh, from about four o'clock in the afternoon till when they get back to work at seven or eight o'clock the next morning, maybe even nine o'clock to speed it up a little bit. So they shorten the day artificially weeks ahead of when it naturally happens so they can ship plants very early on in the holiday seasons. So they measure the amount of day length. Sometimes we call it uh, day length, but it's really they're measuring how long the night is. Now, this can be a problem for some gardeners who like to grow certain plants here in Florida. A good example are strawberries. If you grew up in the north like I did in Wisconsin, we would start picking strawberries sometime in June, assuming the weather wasn't too cold. And you think about it, gee, what are the day lengths like in June in Wisconsin or the northern tier states? They're over 16 hours, probably 17, almost 18 in some cases, depending on where, like in Canada. Eh? Anyhow, so those strawberry plants are keyed in and flowering on those very long days. Let's say you want to grow strawberries in Florida, and you have a hard time finding strawberries locally. A lot of people go www. I can buy it on the internet and have it shipped to my house. dot com. You know what I'm talking about. If you get cultivars that are for the north, and you plant them here in Florida, we don't start strawberry growing till about the end of September when it's starting to get closer to some cool down, hopefully. And we grow them from end of September in, into October, November, December, January, February, roughly March for the picking here. But home could go a little beyond that. But the point is, what are the daylight? What is the day length or what is the night length light at that time of the year? That's correct. The days are very short. So we've had to develop strawberry cultivars. University of Florida, some other universities in the Deep South have developed cultivars of strawberries that will grow and flower on short days. We do a lot of manipulation of plants, don't we, boys and girls? So you got to know which cultivar it is and what kind of day length. Let's talk about those ever-bearing ones. You say, well, that should do. They really don't do very well in Florida, but they're considered day neutral, but they, they really don't do that well.
some plants exhibit a juvenile stage. These aren't great photographs or scan from an old college textbook, but you get the idea. Let's look at the upper right hand picture. That is a juvenile form of a eucalyptus. If you've ever seen those uh, uh, silver dollar ones, that's a good example. Their leaves are generally kind of oval or roundish in youth. Don't ask me why, it's just the way the plant wants to be. But as an adult, it shows a phase change to where they're long elliptical or pointed, however you want to describe it. And it's not always easy to delineate this phase change. But a lot of plants, nut trees, fruit trees, etc., exhibit a, a long juvenile phase. What do I mean by that? It's kind of like us during our juvenile years. We're unreproductive. Although we have all the organs and equipment ready to go, it's not till we get to puberty that we're able to produce offspring. So think of this juvenile state into adult state as a form of plant puberty. Why is this important? Let's go back to the avocados we talked about before. I like Haas avocado. I plant the pit. Will I get an avocado tree? Yes, of course I'll get an avocado tree. It's an avocado. Will I get the cultivar Haas? No, because Haas has to be maintained asexually. That seed is sexual reproduction. So, but a lot of people who plant the Haas avocado pit, put it in the ground, watch it grow, and then wait and wonder what's wrong when it doesn't produce avocados the first year or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten it'll take generally speaking for some of these fruit bearing trees before they're able to reproduce flower and reproduce about eight to ten sometimes twelve years now in the budding and grafting process we copy or clone from a known plant like a Haas we take a little bud or we take a little um, piece of a stick called a scion and we graft it onto the rootstock remember Haas avocado has been around for since I believe the 1940s it has gone through puberty many many years ago obviously the adult wood that we graft with will immediately be able to produce fruit that's why when you go to some of the box stores and you see these twigs of trees like mangoes and you see uh, avocados or citrus and they got five fruit on there, it was grafted from adult wood from known cultivars. We'll explain maybe that more in plant propagation if need to. Here's a plant, you probably uh, have it, you probably are cussing it, it's an invasive, but uh, Pothos, Devil's Ivy, better name for it. Most vines, when they're juvenile, their leaves look a little different. Most vines like to start life as an understory plant, and then they scramble up other plants uh, toward the sunlight. And as it scrambles up, you'll notice here, this one's in downtown Brooksville, not far from where I live. And at some point, it, that part of the plant has become adult, at which point that plant could flower and produce viable seeds. Now, the lower portion of the plant is still juvenile, but the upper portion is adult. Notice the leaves are larger, and sometimes they'll look split or have holes. This is true of like the Swiss cheese planter Monstera, which is, this is a cousin to it.
and here you can kind of see it climbing up the tree and starting the change in about three feet up it's going from juvenile to adult at which point the adult form of it is very hard to root that's why a lot of times we do budding and grafting of all these cultivars of fruit and nut trees because they no longer will produce advantageous roots but we all have probably grown devil's ivy from cuttings when we grew it as houseplants in another state or maybe you've done it down here There are descriptive classifications of our climate. And we can call it, and the state has three real different areas. We have our temperate areas, which are primarily in the panhandle. The peninsula, about halfway to three quarters of the way down, is subtropical. And then the southern tip would be a tropical zone. Now, if we look at the picture in the upper uh, the upper picture that has 1990 this was a uh, USDA plant hardiness map from that era and it shows Pasco County smack dab practically in the middle of a 9a climate 9a means we get periodic frosts and freezes then in 2012 they updated the maps and you can see all of Pasco County suddenly became a 9b and many new books will use the new USDA hardiness. Other books are still using the old. Other books may be using some other uh, plant hardiness zone maps. So when you see these zones in some of the books, 
try to go to the front or the glossary in the back and see which one they're using from which from which era that can make a difference as to what will grow or what we can recommend to grow here personally and professionally i think usda did us a very big disservice in central florida specifically hernando pasco counties where i'm very familiar with for 18 years having lived in brooksville for over 18 years of my life now and they have parts of the eastern part of the county in 9b the ridge manor area which i know for a fact is not warmer than downtown brooksville and they put all the pasco county into 9b i totally disagree my feeling is from about hudson along uh, highway 52 and then down toward dave city and zephyr hills that's much more of a 9a climate the other area is more 9b especially as you get closer to the gulf of mexico but even the 9a 9b is not a tropical zone in other words tropical plants will struggle here but people try to grow them here because you just go a few miles down the road they're available and if you go right along st pete by the beach down there they're a tad bit warmer so people see these and it's oh so pretty and oh i want to have one and i see one available at a box store so we see what i call zone creep these tropical plants being moved further north and then about every five maybe ten years may go by and we get clobbered with a hard frosty night We've seen that in 2010. We saw that in 2008. Many of you may not have been here before 2010. So you saw these plants come back into the landscapes and then in 2018 get clobbered again. It ha happens time to time. I like to say this. Americans have rotten memories. one slide would be if I were to put my finger over in Southern California like San Diego you can kind of look that they both have that tannish color All right, so you got your reference for San Diego here, and look at the heat zone map. See how nice and blue it is? We're both 9A climates. Now, where else do you see a, a color blue like that on that map? Well, you go up into the Oregon and Washington and Montana, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go to my hometown, Milwaukee. If you're not sure where that is, find Chicago and go up about about hmm, about a half an inch and there's a little blue blob there that's Milwaukee so look at the heat zone for Milwaukee versus San Diego about the same yet for cold we're about on par with Central Florida as is San Diego that's why California can grow things during the summer or winter that we just can't they don't get the frost so they're luckier and they don't get the intense heat of summer that we do. It's a whole different world, even though they're both 9A. 
The only other 9A climate that is similar to us is, you know, South Texas, like the Galveston area, also with rainfall. That's why all those books that you brought, if you brought them from the north, those gardening books fail. As you can see, we're in a very unique climate. This is why people have a lot of plant failure, because they're doing things that only work in the northern tier of the middle Atlantic states and things like that. I pretty much talked about that. Go past it. I saw this heat zone map a few years ago and I copy it here and it shows how the center spine of the state is even hotter longer than we are here in most of Pasco County. I found this very interesting. Can't really interpret it beyond that but I found it interesting that look at the east coast of our state. They get fewer heat days than we do in central or west uh, side of the state. I never really realized that. Let's wrap this up with a couple of things that will come to back to haunt us as master gardeners. Let's talk about parasites for a minute. Parasites of plants, that is. Mistletoe is a parasite, as you can see in the upper picture. You can see how it's invaded into its host tree and is sucking out water and nutrients from it. Yes, mistletoe is green, and yes, it does photosynthesize, but it is robbing that particular tree, usually some kind of a hardwood tree, of water and nutrients. The lower picture, you usually see it best on those trees that lose their leaves, and all of a sudden you have these green balls throughout the, the canopy of mistletoe. Well, that tree with that much mistletoe evenly scattered through the canopy is in a major severe dis state of decline. If I were just to lop off that mistletoe, it's going to re-sprout from where it's still inside the plant, the tree tissue. And meanwhile, it's been weakening the tree steadily over the course of time. These kind of trees with that kind of mistletoe become a hazard. Parasite. Let's go back to the Latin for para. Para is within, site is, in this case, an organism or a plant. So this is an organism invading inside its host. Parasite.
Then we go round and round with people all the time about ball moss and its cousin Spanish moss. Both are in the bromeliaceae, the bromeliad family. It's a cousin to pineapple. This is correct. It is a flowering plant, although we usually don't think of it as such because the flowers are fairly insignificant. But it does spread itself around through seeds that can blow in the air. It is typically found on our oak trees in abundance in some cases. And while it can shade out limbs, and that's potentially an issue, it is not a parasite. It is an epiphyte. Epi is a pond, phyte is a plant. So it's upon the plant, it is using it as a support mechanism only. It is not wa invading the host tissue or robbing it of water or nutrients. Now people say, but my tree has been getting worse and the moss is growing faster. It must be the thing that's causing the plant to die. Usually what it is the case is that the plant has some other issue, wasn't planted right, wrong plant in the wrong place, improper care culture, something like that, maybe damage to the base by a weed whacker or a lawnmower. And as a tree is declining, there are fewer leaves being produced by the tree. As a result, the Spanish moss and ball moss grow better without being shaded themselves. I think one of the reasons why people think it's not or think it's a parasite is because of the grayish color. But if you get it wet or look at it right after the rain, you'll see a very green undertone to it. The white fuzziness of it is, are a whole bunch of hairs that are silver in color, much like silver palmettos or the blue palmettos, it helps reflect the intense sun away, thus helping it survive during drought periods. Also those hairs will grab onto the moisture out of the atmosphere in the morning and when we have high dew points and high humidities and rainfall events. So it's an adaptation to not having a root system. As you can see, in tropical areas, many plants use trees as a support mechanism. These are all sorts of species of bromeliad somewhere in the tropics. Next time you look at most of the orchids that are at the grocery store, I call those tree weaves. They're an epiphytic plant. They're clinging onto the tree or other plant and using it as a support device. They're not robbing it of water and nutrients, much like your orchids that are grown in bark. You survived botany and taxonomy for the Master Gardener. Now go and have a break, and we'll come back with some other great stuff for you to learn, and we will have more fun along the way.